But uh, I want to start in uh, 1 John chapter 3. Now, now realize this. If, if you look at the church, the early church, um, from Jesus' resurrection for about 30 years, the only thing that they preached on was the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus. Think about it. The kingdom of God in the name of Jesus. But yet today we find so little teaching on the subject. So 1 John 3, verse 23, and this is his commandment. Now, I think we all know the great commission. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Commission. But there is also a commandment. The great commandment is this, that you should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ and love one another. So one commandment, two parts. Believe on the name and then love one another. So there is a difference between believing in Jesus and believing on the name of Jesus. In fact, probably this week, we're also going to look at the difference between believing on the name and believing in the name, because there is a difference. But it says here to believe on the name of his son. Right. To believe in Jesus is to believe if Jesus were to come and Jesus were to appear to you and Jesus were to talk to you and Jesus were to lay his hands on you, that you would be healed. You would be delivered. You would have peace. There would be provision. There would be joy. That's believing in Jesus. But to believe on the name of Jesus is to believe that when you personally use his name, it, re- it receives the exact same results because it is the exact same authority as if Jesus himself were personally present. So believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ. We believe on the name for salvation, by the way, and you believe in the name for the works. How many remember Jesus said, the works that I do, will you do also? And even greater works than these shall you do because I go to the Father. So Jesus expects Christians to do what he did. Right? Now, remember Joshua 1.8, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night that you may observe to do according to all that's written therein. You see, as you're meditating on the word of God, What you should begin to see in your mind, right, is you need to see yourself doing the same things that Jesus did. Most people, when they read Mark chapter five, the woman with the issue of blood comes up behind Jesus and touches the hem of his garment. Most people, when they meditate on that, they see themselves as the woman with the issue of blood. But what Jesus is telling us we should do is we should see ourselves as Jesus. Because the works that he did will you do also. You see, you've been given his name. You have that authority. What he did, you can do in his name. But if we do not see it happening on the inside first, right? You're never going to see it on the outside. Realize this. Every miracle happens on the inside before it happens on the outside. You've got to see it first on the inside. So you meditate on his word day and night. John chapter 16, verse 23. And in that day, now Jesus is talking literally about the future, right? Uh, In the Old Testament, they prayed to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He said, but there's a day that you're not going to be praying to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob anymore. He says, when you address God, you're going to address him in my name, right? In that day, you will ask me nothing. How many of you know that many Christians pray to Jesus? But Jesus is telling you, you don't do that. He says, you do not pray to me. He said, you pray to the Father in my name. Listen, one of the key reasons that Jesus came was so you and I could have a relationship with God the Father. That relationship was broken by Adam and Eve. Way back in the garden, that relationship was broken. But Jesus came to restore that relationship. He wants you and I to have a relationship with God the Father. He taught us to pray our Father. 
who art in heaven. And, and, and I want to remind you of something. All right. Uh, I've heard people take, for example, uh, Malachi chapter three. It says, uh, bring all, this, all the tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Improve me now with this. If I won't open for you the windows of heaven and pour you out such a blessing, there won't be room enough to receive it. And this is what they'll say. They say, you know what? If, if you don't do that, I've heard it said this way. If you don't tithe, God will take it out of your hide. All right. And, and really what they have is they have the Godfather. Instead of God, the father, God, the father loves you. All right. I remember the Godfather. Yeah. I'm not going to send somebody over. We're going to take him out. Come on. All right. He, he's not God, the Godfather. All right. He is God, your heavenly father. And in John 17, Jesus said, he's praying. He says that you have loved them even as you have loved me. So here's what Jesus said, that God the Father loves you and loves me exactly the same as he loves Jesus. All right? He's not the Godfather. He is God the Father. All right? So remember that in that day, you will ask me nothing. Most assuredly, I say to you, whatever you ask the Father, who are we praying to? The Father. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it you until now. You've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full. I mean, I just say this prayer should bring joy. Prayer should bring joy. Um, most of you know that uh, our, our messages are, are going out in the Middle East in, in several different languages. And um, Weekly, sometimes even a couple times a week, we'll be doing FaceTime with people in, in the Middle East. And uh, it's interesting when, when we're done talking about what God's doing and praying, uh, sometimes we cry, but I think most of the time we're laughing. We're just laughing at what God is doing because it's just so beyond anything we could have ever imagined. You know what? Prayer should bring joy. But literally what Jesus is telling us is that as believers, we have power of attorney to use his name. Now, again, this is just a simple illustration. But Jeannie and I lived in Mexico for seven years. Um, at one point, we were living in an Indian center, an Indian village. And a fast turnaround on mail was 30 days. That was fast. Right? 60 days, 90 days was not uncommon. Turn around on mail. And of course, we had no telephones. This was before the internet. Right? So my brother-in-law, Daryl, had power of attorney. Right? Now, whatever meager resources we had in the bank, right, he could just go and just because he had power of attorney, he could take everything out. He could do whatever he wanted with our resources because he had our power of attorney. We were absent and he represented us. Now, Jesus is not here physically because he's seated at the right hand of God the Father in the most powerful position in the universe, right? However, he's given you his name. He's given me his name to represent him. And, and legally, we would actually say that he gave us the power of attorney. Now, when somebody has that the power of eternity of attorney, what determines the, 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 the power, the authority that is behind the name are the resources that are behind the name. Right. So when, when Daryl had power of attorney for us, let me tell you something. It didn't mean much because there was not much there. All right. There was very little there. I think our first year we made three thousand five hundred dollars. First year in ministry, total. And I spent half of it on books, books and tapes, right? You, those of you who don't know what a tape is, you, you, can, you can Google that and find that out, all right? all right? But when we use the name of Jesus, it is, it is as if Jesus himself was standing there and saying what we're saying, doing what we're doing. Right? And the resources that are behind his name are there. 
That's the power that we have. So Jesus said this, Matthew 28. Jesus spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. How much authority is in the name? All authority. Philippians chapter two. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. And that reminds you that Isaiah, the prophet said this, for this reason, he will be exalted that he may have mercy on you. Why is Jesus exalted to have mercy on you? Now, listen, there's saving mercy, but there's delivering mercy. There's healing mercy. When the blind men came to Jesus and said, have mercy on us, what did they want? Healing mercy. For this reason, he was exalted that he may have mercy mercy on you. Therefore, God has highly exalted him, given him a name above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, those on earth, those under the earth. Heaven is talking about God's spiritual realm. On earth is talking about the realm that you and I live in. And under the earth is talking about the demonic realm. So literally in three worlds, Every knee bows to the name of Jesus. Every name will bow. And that's the authority that's behind his name. In Colossians 2.15, uh, I have the love of this translation. It says, he, Jesus, openly displayed Jesus' triumph over Satan, disarming him. What did he do to Satan? He disarmed him. And his whole band of spirits down to the last demon, down to the last demon. I, I think I mentioned to you about a month ago, I, I was doing a, a FaceTime with someone in the Middle East who we would probably refer to as a, as a shaman, very famous in his country. And the first question he asked me was this. When he had contacted us, this was the way that he contacted our team in Pakistan. He said, this is how he started. He said, I have 50,000 demons at my disposal at any moment, 50,000. And then he said, five of my closest associates have been listening to the videos, right? And they've all left me and rejected me and received Jesus. So I need to talk to him so we can work together. So his first question as we're talking was, do you believe that Jesus has as much power as all the demons that I have at my disposal? And I simply quoted Luke 10. Jesus said, over all the power of the enemy over all the power of the enemy and nothing will by any means harm you. All right? So we see that Jesus name is exalted, that he, he defeated Satan and his demons down to the last demon. There is not one demon, not one that can stand before the name of Jesus in Hebrews chapter three and verse one, it says, who being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person. Now it's talking about Jesus in express image of his person. One translation says he's a mirror image of Jesus. So if you want to know what God's like, look at Jesus. Not that look at Jesus. Jesus is perfect theology. He in a perfect way shows us what God the father is like upholding all things by the word of his power. When he had made him, when, when he by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So Jesus sat down at the highest seat in the universe. That's where he's at. Right? And he sat down. Listen, Jesus did not sit down because he was tired. He didn't go, oh, I fought Satan. I fought all those demons. I'm telling you, I'm so tired. I'm sitting down. I'm resting for a while. I'm taking a few days off. No, 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 no. He sat down because he was done. Satan was completely, totally defeated. There was nothing left to do to pay for your sins and my sins. There was nothing left to do to make you and I right with God. In fact, in Romans chapter four, it says that Jesus was raised because of, or when we were justified. Got that? The fact that Jesus was raised from the dead is proof that the courts of heaven were satisfied 
And your sin and my sin was paid for. And that includes everybody's sin. Now, here's the thing. You have to receive it. You have to believe it. You have to receive it. But it's paid for. So we have to use that name. We have to use the name to receive the rights and the privileges that we have in Jesus. I don't know if this story is true, but I believe it's a good illustration. I heard this years ago. There was a man in Europe and during a time of, of, of dire need in Europe, and he saved money to come to the United States. And he saved and he saved and he finally got enough to buy a ticket to come across to the United States. He only had a, a little bit of money left and he bought a box of crackers. And so he got on the boat and they're crossing the Atlantic to come to New York City. And every day he'd, he'd look into that banquet room. And how many have ever been on a cruise? Oh, it's like impossible to not gain 10 pounds. I mean, there's just food and there's this abundance of awesome food. And, and he would just look in there and he'd grab a couple crackers took like 14 days to cross. And every day he'd look in there and he'd see everybody eating all that fine food and having all those great desserts. And he'd just have a couple crackers. It's the last day. And the captain came up to him and, and, and said, he said, uh, he said, I, I never saw you in the dining room. He, he said, uh, did, did you find our, our food was not any good? Were you, you offended by the food? Did you not like it? And the man said, oh, he said, I just had enough money to get a ticket. And then I bought a box of crackers and I've just been eating the crackers and I ran out a couple days ago. He said, but I didn't have enough money for a meal ticket. And the captain said, didn't you know that when you bought the ticket to cross it included all your meals? Now, listen, that's a lot of Christians today. You see, when you receive Jesus, it included Joy and peace and deliverance and healing. In fact, David talked about those benefits even in the Old Testament. He said, bless the Lord, O oh my soul, forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so your youth is renewed like the eagles. You know, he's talking about the benefits under the old covenant, but the Bible says we have a better covenant. We've got a better one, right? There's benefits that belong to us, right? In fact, in second Peter chapter one in verse three, it says this, it says, by which have been given to us exceeding great and precious promises that through these, you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. And he goes on before this, and he, he says that he has provided for us all things that pertain to life, your natural life, and godliness, your spiritual life. You know, part of the, whatever it is that we need in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, God foresaw what was going to be needed, right? You re remember that. When Abraham was going to take his son and sacrifice his son, he climbs up with his son, Isaac, up on the top of Mount Moriah, and he builds the altar. Right? He puts his son on the altar. He lifts that knife, and God says, stop. He said, I didn't want your son. I just wanted you to be willing to give me everything. And then it says that Abraham lifted up his eyes, and there was a, a ram caught in the brush. God provided the sacrifice before he ever went there. In fact, this is what he said as he's coming down. He says, Jehovah Jireh, right? We sometimes just say the Lord who provides. Yeah, but it actually means the God who looks ahead and provides. The God who looks ahead. When God created the world, I want you to think about this. He created man on the last day. And it's really good that he did, right? God didn't create man and man go, oh, I need something to eat. And God said, hold it, I'll, I'll make some trees. He didn't create man and man go, I need air. God go, oh, hold it, hold it. 
I mean, no, God created everything that man needed before he created man. And and listen, before you and I ever have a need, God's already provided for all things that pertain to life and godliness. Right. He has he is the God who looks ahead and provides. Right. So. When when the Bible tells us in Colossians, Jesus having despoiled the principalities and powers. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Jesus defeated Satan, but it really shows us a picture of a battle that Jesus fought for victory when he arose from the dead. He threw off from himself the principalities and powers. So listen, if you've got a demon that's bothering you, you need to throw him off in Jesus name. That spirit is defeated. And in Jesus name, it needs to bow its knee when it's in his name. We put them in their place because Jesus has defeated them. And that's really God's plan. In Ephesians chapter three and verse 10, it says to to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church. So this is saying God's plan. God, the victory Jesus won is to be made known by whom? By the, by the church to principalities and powers, Satan and demons. In other words, God wants the church. I mean, you know, this building isn't the church. We're the church. All right. And he wants the church to show Satan and demons that they are defeated. In other words, he wants the church to put them in their place. Now, what we mostly do is we want, we're like, God, the devil's after me. Get him. That's basically our attitude. God, sick him. And God's like, I gave you the name of Jesus. I gave you the word of God. I've given you the blood of Jesus. Use it. Use it. (laughs) Revelation chapter one. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us. Get this. This is you made you and I to be kings and priests to God and the Father, to whom be glory and dominion forever and ever. He's made you a priest. He's made you a king with Jesus' name. And when Jesus grappled with Satan, conquered him, left him paralyzed, whipped, and defeated, he's saying, now what we need to do is we need to use his name to keep that enemy under. Now, remember, Jesus said the thief, that's the devil. He comes only to steal, to kill and destroy. He's a robber. He's a thief, right? How many of you know thieves don't do what's legal? They do what they can get away with. The devil doesn't do what's legal. He does what he can get away with, right? And you and I, we're kind of like the police, right? We're the ones that have the authority to stop him dead in his tracks. This is what Jesus said, Luke 11. When a strong man fully armed guards his own palace, his goods are in peace. But when one stronger than him comes upon him, overcomes him, he takes from him all his armor in which he trusted and despises the spoil. That's exactly what Jesus did to the devil. The devil thought he had everything tied up. But Jesus, stronger than him, came and spoiled him. Right? And he arose from the dead, victor, master in three worlds, seated at the most high place in the entire universe. And he said, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth. Right. So and then he said, go you, therefore, go you, therefore. In Luke 10, Jesus said this, Luke 10, 19, he said, behold, look, I've given you power to tread on serpents 
and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm you. Guys, if you could leave that verse up for a moment, right? You guys have it in King James? You do. Beautiful. All right. This is the Bible that Paul used and Jesus used, the King James Bible. <laughs> All right. Now, notice that the word power is used twice. But in the Greek language, it's two completely different words. Right? When Jesus said, I give unto you power, it is the Greek word exousia. And this is what it means, authoritative power. Right? authoritative power. And when he said that second word over all the power, it's the word dunamis, right? It's miracle working power, right? So Satan has dunamis, but we have exousia. We have authority power. So here's the difference between the two. Um, you've probably at some time in your life, if you, if you're very old and have driven much, you've come across a traffic signal that wasn't working. And there was somebody, probably a policeman standing there directing traffic, right? So here comes an 18 wheeler, probably weighs 50,000 pounds, barreling at this guy at 60 miles an hour. And you know what he does? Because he has exousia. Because he has authority power, all he does is lift his hand. And you know what that car, that, that, that 18 wheeler is going to do? They're going to hit the brakes. All right? Now, what that 18 wheeler has is it has dunamis. All right? It has, it has momentum. It has weight. It has literally what we would might refer to here as miracle power. It, it in the natural is more powerful than the police officer who's just putting up their hand. But because the police officer has exousia, has authority power, that 18-wheeler has to stop, right? So here's what I'm saying to you. In the natural, you are no match for the devil. But you're not in the natural. You are in the spiritual realm. And you have spiritual authority. And Jesus said, you have spiritual authority over everything the devil can do. Everything. He said, and nothing. How many things? Nothing will by any means harm or hurt you. But we have to release that power. Now, the Bible, again, it commands us to believe in the name, that we have that name, that we have authority in that name. And when we speak that name, it is just the same as if Jesus was personally standing there. Right? That's what it is to believe on that name. Right? So Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it will eat its fruit. It's amazing to me how many of us as Christians, although we have authority, we do not use that authority. Right? And again, we often say, oh, God, do this. God, do that. God's already done everything he's going to do. Jesus arose and said, all authority is given to me. Go you, therefore. Who did he give that authority to? The church. To you and I as believers, he's given that authority. Right? Um, one last scripture. We have a centurion who has a sick servant. And this, this, this is found in Matthew chapter Eight, but this is a great example for us. They say, Lord, the surgeon says, my servant is lying at home, paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. And Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion said to him, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but speak the word only and my servant will be healed. Yeah, so often what we want is we want Jesus to show up to personally be there, right? But this man said, if you will just speak the word, just speak the word only, my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority. What kind of power do we have? Authority. That's what we have. Un having soldiers unto me, and I say to this one, go, and he goes, to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does that. And when Jesus heard it, he marveled. Do you know, Jesus didn't marvel much. 
But he marveled. He marveled at this man's faith. And he said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Now, there's only two times that it's mentioned that Jesus marvels. All right. And here's what I think is interesting. Both times, it's a Gentile. It's not a Jew. And now here's what I'm saying. Both times, it's someone who wasn't trying to be righteous by obeying the law. Okay. And remember, Paul identifies the law and he, in two ways. He said he called it the ministry of death and the ministry of condemnation. Right. Most people think the purpose of the law is to make you righteous. It's not. The purpose of the law is to show you you're a sinner and you need a savior. That's the purpose of the law. Right. And when people try to keep the law, they, they, they say, you know, I've got to be good enough. I've got to do everything right. Let me just tell you, you'll never do it all right. So the Bible in the book of Revelations tells us Jesus said that one of Satan's names is the accuser of the brethren. How many of you can look back at the last month and say, I blew it someplace? The rest of you, you're liars and you just need to raise your hand. <laughs> all right. You, the, the devil will always show you what you've done wrong. And if you're trying to be good enough for God to bless you, to answer your prayer, good enough for God to use you, you will never make it. Not in a hundred years, you won't make it. And the two times that Jesus marvels at people's faith, they're both Gentiles. They weren't trying to be right with God by obeying the law. They understood it's grace. It's just grace. It's just his mercy. And for this purpose, he was exalted that he may have mercy on you. Well, before we close one more time, I want to go to Mark chapter 16. All right. This is what Jesus said. He said, these signs will follow those that believe in my name. The list begins with they will cast out demons. You have the authority to do that. Jesus expected all believers, right? not super Christians, not pastors or evangelists. Those that believe in his name cast out demons. The, the list ends where they will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. All right? So if you have any sickness in your body, and you can, I'd like you to put your hand over that sickness. Lay hands on yourself. Right? Um, I, I was doing a FaceTime yesterday uh, with the Middle East, and uh, the man I was talking to mentioned, he said that his wife had gone and, and had a, a ladies' Bible study. I said, and there were 20 ladies there. He said, at the end of the message that they listened to, he said, you prayed. He said, and every one of those 20 ladies had something wrong. Every one of those 20 ladies were instantly healed. And the power of God was so present in that room that he that at least three of them literally fell out under the power of God. Right? You say, why does that happen more someplace else than it does here? Unbelief. Our unbelief. Our unbelief. It says that Jesus could there do no mighty work because of their unbelief. Right? We need to believe that he was exalted, that he can have mercy on us. So I'm just going to ask you to repeat this. Just say, Heavenly Father, I thank you that you forgive all of my iniquities and you heal all of my diseases. And in the name of the Lord Jesus, I place hands on myself. And in Jesus' name, I command sickness, go! Every disease, I command you to go. And I loose the healing power of God from the top of my head to the soles of my feet to bring health, healing, restoration, soundness, and deliverance 
to the glory of God in Jesus' name. And I thank you for it. Hallelujah. Woo! Yes. Yes, yes. Say, would you bow your heads for just a moment? Again, in a group of this size, there's people in all sorts of spiritual conditions.